A number of um, forces have come together in recent years to uh, back geoengineering, or certainly research into geoengineering, if not yet the deployment of these schemes. And uh, we should recognise there's a broad range of technologies. So let's talk in particular about sulphate aerosol spraying, which is kind of the, um, the leading uh, method that is talked about and which many people believe is likely to be deployed. And of course, sulphate uh, aerosol spraying means coating the earth with a layer of sulphate aerosols to reduce the amount of sunlight and, and so cool the planet. And so on the scientific side, a number of uh, eminent scientists have said we must do research into geoengineering, including sulphate aerosol spraying, uh, beginning with the very famous uh, paper in 2006 from uh, uh, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist, who said, uh, the situation is looking so dire, uh, so bad for the earth, that we need to investigate plan B. And of course, um, Whilst uh, he may have been politically naive, he had the best of intentions because there's no questioning his environmental credentials and commitment. Um, quite a few other scientists have now come into the geoengineering field, a lot in fact. Uh, some of them are aggressively pushing for major research programs in geoengineering and probably the foremost uh, scientist is uh, David Keith from Harvard. Um, who is a very uh, effective advocate for geoengineering, including sulphate aerosol spraying. He wants to test uh, equipment for, for doing sulphate aerosol spraying uh, in the United States. Um, one could argue that the motives of the scientists are quite pure. They are uh, interested in research. They're, they're very worried. They're anxious about climate change and the failure of the world to respond adequately. Uh, but we've seen uh, a number of other forces, uh, uh, non-scientific forces, take a strong interest in geoengineering. There have been some commercial ventures uh, who've invested particularly in uh, ocean iron fertilisation and various forms of carbon capture. In fact, David Keith himself has his very own company uh, investing in uh, carbon capture, that is sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so there are some commercial interests who can see um, money in it. Um, Bill Gates is investing in it, not, I think, because he believes he can make money in it, but because he thinks that um, uh, these technological solutions coming from nowhere, a kind of Silicon Valley approach, is the way to tackle climate change because politics are too hard. Politics have failed, so we need a techno fix. So there's a strong element of that amongst entrepreneurs. Richard Branson is probably the most um, obvious example. He, he has a kind of Branson has a has a kind of uh, messiah complex, and he believes that by promoting geoengineering and he's putting money into it, um, he can come up with the magic solution to uh, to global warming. But then there are some more directly political forces, especially in the United States. And so we have seen uh, remarkably uh, right-wing think tanks uh, like the American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, the notorious Heartland Foundation, all of which have been active in promoting climate science denial, who have nevertheless come out in support of geoengineering. And this seems like a strange kind of paradox. How can you advocate a solution to a problem you say does not exist? And of course the answer is that for conservatives who want to protect the political economic system, who um, do not want to uh, concede anything to environmentalists, um, geoengineering looks like a kind of um, uh, ideologically compatible solution to climate change as opposed to carbon pricing, emissions trading, regulation, all of which they're strongly opposed to. And so these conservative forces uh, uh, support geoengineering because it does not interfere in the marketplace. It does not, on the face of it at least, require government intervention in energy markets. It, it allows Exxon to continue doing what Exxon has always done. It, uh, it protects the American way of life 
because you don't have to increase gasoline prices. Uh, and so it protects the political economic system. And so uh, they believe that through geoengineering, they can get out of this really ridiculous situation where they're denying the facts um, and yet not have to concede that the answer to climate change is intervention in the market. And we have not seen this kind of political tipping point yet, but it's quite possible that soon in the United States we could see Republicans, uh, for whom their denial of science is more and more difficult and contradictory, we could see one or two important Republicans come out and say, well, let's uh, not impose uh, government restrictions on energy markets or consumers or oil companies. Uh, let's use American ingenuity. Let's use a techno fix to solve this problem. I think there's a strong likelihood that that will happen at some point, perhaps quite soon. Well, talking about geoengineering, particularly sulphate aerosol spraying, which would effectively install a global thermostat uh, where, roughly speaking, whoever controlled it could turn the temperature down a bit or a lot or back up. Um, you can see that immediately this gives rise to some serious anxieties about global conflict. With carbon abatement, Plan A, uh, we need the cooperation of all of the major players to um, simultaneously reduce their carbon emissions. In the case of sulphate aerosol spraying um, or um, ocean iron fertilization and one or two other sort of planetary scale technologies, it would take uh, probably only one major player or even one middle-sized country uh, could do it, uh, North Korea perhaps, uh, certainly China uh, could do it. So one nation could decide to send up a fleet of planes and spray sulphates or other chemicals um, into the atmosphere and uh, as long as they maintained this program they could cool the planet. The problem, or one of the many problems, is that Cooling the planet in this way would have differential effects on the global weather patterns. And so some places would cool by more, uh, some places would become drier, some places would become wetter, uh, possibly the Indian monsoon might be uh, disrupted. And so this opens up the possibility of uh, serious uh, geopolitical conflict over who has their hand on the global thermostat. Uh, so the ethical problems um, start there, and there are, there are many of them uh, that, uh, that come up as soon as we start talking about geoengineering. Well, one of the biggest ethical questions um, is, uh, is the question of whether it is right and proper for human beings to attempt to regulate the climate of the planet as a whole. And of course, it would, if human beings could do that, or some of them, they would regulate it in the interests of themselves uh, and, uh, and certainly of human beings uh, rather than other creatures on the planet. So there's a kind of profound ethical dilemma here of whether humans should attempt to play God. Uh, because, of course, for uh, as long as the Earth has been here for 4.5 billion years, the climate of the Earth system has been determined by unconscious natural forces. Uh, and so here we would have a conscious decision-making creature coming along and deciding deliberately to alter the climate of planet Earth. That is the biggest dilemma, but there are many others. I mean, for example, there is the scientific question of whether we should do research. Now, if you ask most scientists, they always give a standard stock answer, and that is 
more information is always a good thing because it will allow better decision making. Even if we decide on the basis of the information that geoengineering is not a good idea. Uh, but there's more to it, of course, because information is never neutral. Uh, information on geoengineering will change the situation. Information on sulfate aerosol spraying um, will, of course, uh, be used in political ways to advance certain arguments. And those who are supporting sulfate aerosol spraying will be inclined to emphasize the positives coming out of a research program and downplay the negatives. Of course, we've always seen this. This happens with nuclear power, uh, GM crops, uh, agricultural chemicals. This is always the situation. So we have to ask ourselves whether a research program, uh, a big research program that uh, gave us a lot of information on sulfate aerosol spraying, whether that would in fact, um, even if it showed very serious problems with it, whether the existence of this information would make sulfate aerosol spraying more likely, uh, simply because we understand it better. Well, geoengineering obviously has very important strategic implications for um, every country, if it were to go ahead, uh, or even if it were threatened. Um, and, and so, of course, the, the generals have always dreamed of controlling the weather. Uh, Napoleon dreamed of controlling the weather, uh, of stopping the Russian winter. The Americans um, had a, an active program of making rain uh, during the Vietnam War to try to make the Ho Chi Minh Trail so wet that the Viet Cong could not transport their materials down the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. So um, uh, the weather or the climate more generally is, is a military question as well as a civilian question. And so if uh, there were serious plans to engage in sulfate aerosol spraying, of course, the military would be involved. And so uh, we uh, have seen that the military uh, and the security services have taken an interest in geoengineering. Um, at the moment, as far as we know, uh, they are only engaged in a watching brief, keeping an eye on what the scientists in various countries are doing. There are scientists in Russia doing research in geoengineering uh, and in China research in geoengineering and so uh, the military and the security services are watching it. So for example there was a very big report on um, geoengineering which the uh, US National Academy of Science produced uh, last year and one of the funding agencies for the research that led to that report was the CIA. So certainly the security agencies are taking uh, an interest in geoengineering, and uh, you would expect them to do that. Will Plan B uh, be applied? Well, uh, it depends on which Plan B we're talking about. If we're talking about certain uh, carbon capture and removal technologies, uh, such as uh, reforestation, then um, that is already going ahead. Um, if we're talking about uh, a, a, a big industry to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, concentrate it and then pump it in underground somewhere, I think uh, the economics of that might rule it out. Uh, but um, sulfate aerosol spraying has a lot of um, attractions. It's cheap, it's relatively easy, it's not technologically sophisticated, and it would work quickly. So if we can imagine in, say, 2030, there is a sudden spike in global temperatures um, and, and, and massive disruption to global climates. And um, the Chinese government, for example, has huge social unrest because there's a, a drought uh, and famine. Uh, 
the temptation in uh, those desperate times to engage in desperate measures could be very high. So I think that um, it is easy to imagine plausible scenarios in the next uh, 15 to 30 years when, yes, geoengineering could become a very attractive option for desperate governments. Those of us who uh, are active writing about and campaigning on climate change do so because we take science very, very seriously. We listen to what the climate scientists, the IPCC, is saying, and uh, <clears throat> it's their research, it's their publications that is the basis for our understanding of the world. And, uh, and that is why we are activists, that is why we are worried, because the science is so strong. And then we come to chemtrails. So we ask ourselves, uh, is there any science that backs the claims of the chemtrailers? I mean, it's actually quite hard to work out what the chemtrailers are saying because they say so many things. There are so many chemtrail chemicals in the atmosphere and it has so many effects. You know, it's destroying crops, it's controlling our minds, it's killing people. But when we ask where is the science, there is none. There, I've spoken to... Uh, atmospheric physicists and cloud scientists and said, is there any data, is there any science? And uh, they all say, there is nothing, there is no science. It's all, uh, the chemtrails claims are simply uh, invented. Uh, th there are no chemtrails. Um, and so I think we have to be serious about this, you know, that we take science seriously. And uh, it's easy, people are afraid. When I meet chemtrailers, the thing that strikes me most about them is that they are afraid. But they are afraid of the wrong thing. We should be afraid of climate change. We don't need to uh, invent phantoms in the atmosphere. There are enough real things to be afraid of. So let's not waste our time on these fantastic stories that, uh, that people event, uh, invent. It's a distraction. It's not helpful. It's politically damaging. There are many people who could become very effective climate activists who instead uh, just circle around in the weirder parts of the internet uh, inventing conspiracy theories. Let's not go there. Let's be serious. We really have a serious problem before us. So let's focus on climate change.